Practice Test 1. Section 1. Listening Comprehension. Find the directions for this section of the test in your book and read along with them as they are read to you on the tape. This section tests your ability to comprehend spoken English. It is divided into three parts, each with its own directions. During actual exams, you are not permitted to turn the page during the reading of the directions or to take notes at any time. Part A. Directions. Each item in this part consists of a brief conversation involving two speakers. Following each conversation, a third voice will ask a question. You will hear the conversations and questions only once, and they will not be written out. When you have heard each conversation and question, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then, fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Here is an example. You will hear, Do you think I should leave this chair against the wall or put it somewhere else? Over by the window, I'd say. What does the woman think the man should do? You will read, A. Open the window. B. Move the chair. C. Leave the room. D. Take a seat. From the conversation, you find out that the woman thinks the man should put the chair over by the window. The best answer to the question, what does the woman think the man should do, is B. Move the chair. You should fill in B on your answer sheet. Now, let's begin with the first conversation. Number one. I can't find those photographs I just had developed. I think I saw them on the piano. What does the woman mean? Number two. Fred sure was angry. I'll say. He left without saying goodbye to anyone. What does the man say about Fred? Number three. What an uncomfortable looking chair. Well, it may look that way, but just try it out. What does the woman imply? Number four. So, where are the rose gardens? Didn't you say they were here on the west side of the park? No, no, I said they were on the east side. What does the woman mean? Number five. George, is Linda leaving tonight? I think that's what she said. What does George say about Linda? Number six. Two weeks work. Down the drain. Oh, no. Your experiment wasn't successful? What is learned about the man from this conversation? Number seven. I see Carrie's riding her bike again. Did she fix it herself? I think she got her brother to do it. What does the man believe about Carrie? Number eight. Did the band play for about two hours? No. This time the concert was over in an hour and a half. How long did the concert last?
Number nine. Maybe you could get a ride to campus with Peggy tomorrow. Oh, Peggy no longer drives to class. What does the man say about Peggy? Number ten. Swimming is good exercise. Of course, and so is dancing. What does the woman mean? Number eleven. I need to go out. Is it still raining? Yes, but it's starting to let up a little. What does the woman mean? Number twelve. Then you and Robert finished your project on time. Yes. No thanks to Robert. What does the woman imply? Number thirteen. I just heard that Professor Hendricks is retiring at the end of this semester. Too bad. I was hoping to take his chemistry course next semester. What is learned about Professor Hendricks from this conversation? Number fourteen. I'd like some flowers delivered to Hillcrest Hospital. Certainly. If you step over here, I'll show you some arrangements. What is the man going to do? Number fifteen. My watch isn't running. Why not have the jeweler around the corner fix it? What does the woman suggest the man do? Number sixteen. Just think. In another couple of days, I'll be in Montreal. How will you get around once you get there? What does the woman ask the man? Number seventeen. I'm exhausted. I can't wait for the weekend to get here. Need a little rest, do you? What does the man mean? Number eighteen. Diane is always saying she loves to go ice skating. Yes, but when's the last time you actually saw her out on the ice? What does the man imply about Diane? Number nineteen. I'd like to return the sweater because it's too small. I don't have the receipt with me though. You could exchange the sweater for another size, but if you don't have the receipt, I won't be able to give you your money back. What does the woman tell the man? Number twenty. Have you ever eaten at the Fisherman's Grotto? Have I? I never go to the beach without stopping there. What does the woman mean? Number twenty-one. Brenda, will you play that song you wrote? Only if you accompany me on the guitar. What does Brenda want the man to do? Number twenty-two. I'm planning to clean up the kitchen this afternoon. Shouldn't you clean the rest of your apartment while you're at it? What does the woman tell the man? Number twenty-three. That was a great play, wasn't it? Yeah, the cast was wonderful. I could hardly believe they weren't professional actors. 
What does the man mean? Number 24. There are only a few drops left in the can. I guess we'll have to buy some in the morning. Well, we can finish up this job tomorrow. Let's just wash out our brushes for now. What will they probably buy in the morning? Number 25. Jim, can I have one of those bananas you bought? Sorry, they're still not ripe enough. What does Jim mean? Number 26. The students in Professor Murray's class think that the test he gave was unfair. A few of them do, anyway. What can be inferred from this conversation? Number 27. John sure knows some good places to eat, doesn't he? Yeah, when it comes to finding great restaurants, John wrote the book. What does the woman say about John? Number 28. Look at my face. I got sunburned again yesterday. Maybe next time you'll remember to wear your hat when you're working in the garden. What does the woman think the man should do? Number 29. Were any of the windows unlocked? Not one of them. What does the man mean? Number 30. Harry, what's your new roommate like? Well, for one thing, he's very outgoing. What does Harry say about his roommate? This is the end of Part A. Go on to Part B. Now read along with the directions for Part B in your book, as they are read to you on the tape. Part B. Directions. This part of the test consists of extended conversations between two speakers. After each of these conversations, there are a number of questions. You will hear each conversation and question only once, and the questions are not written out. When you have heard the questions, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then, fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Don't forget, during actual exams, taking notes or writing in your test book is not permitted. Now let's begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 to 34. Listen to a conversation on a college campus. Excuse me, I'm trying to find my way to Reynolds Hall. Reynolds Hall? I don't think I know where that is. I'm looking for an exhibit of graduate student paintings. The campus newspaper said it was in Reynolds Hall. Oh, now I know where you mean. Everyone on campus just calls that the art building. So how do I get there? Go straight ahead until you come to the main library. You'll see a walkway leading off to the left. Go that way and then past the chemistry building. Let's see. To the library. Take the walkway to the right and no, then... No, to the left. 
to the left and past the chemistry building. That's right. And then you'll cross a little service road. Walk just a little bit farther, and there's the art building. You can't miss it because there's a big abstract metal sculpture right in front of it. I think I've got it. I hope you enjoy the exhibit. Usually, the graduate student exhibits are very interesting, and I've heard this one is especially good. Actually, the main reason I'm going is that my sister has a couple of paintings in the show. I wanted to take a look at them. Number 31. Why was the woman at first confused when the man asked her for directions? Number 32. According to the woman, what is directly in front of the art building? Number 33. What can be inferred from the conversation about the man's sister? Number 34. What is the woman's attitude toward the man? Questions 35 through 38. Listen to a conversation in an astronomy class. Professor Carmichael, I'd like to ask a question. You just said that, according to Einstein, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Is that right? Yes, Ted. That's what Einstein said, and most scientists agree with him. Then does that mean that we could never build spaceships to go to other stars? Well, let's think about it. Do you remember how far it is to the nearest star? Uh, I think you said a few days ago that it's about four light years. About that. And how fast does light travel? Around 186,000 miles per second. Yes, and a light year is the distance light travels in a year. Imagine that. A light year is the equivalent of almost six trillion miles. But what if we built a ship that could go almost as fast as light? Then we could get to the closest star in four or five years. That's true in theory. Unfortunately, there are no spaceships that can even approach the speed of light. Even if we built ships that are much faster than the rockets we have today, it would probably take hundreds or thousands of years to get to the closest stars. How could you carry enough fuel to last that long? We'd need a completely different method of powering spaceships. So you're saying that you don't think people will ever be able to travel to the stars? Well, I don't want to say never, Ted. Who knows what kinds of scientific breakthroughs there will be. But I think, for the foreseeable future, there will only be starships in science fiction movies and books. Number 35. What had Professor Carmichael been talking about when Ted asked her a question? Number 36. If a ship could travel almost as fast as light, how long would it take to get to the closest star? Number 37. According to Professor Carmichael, what must be developed before ships can travel to the closest stars? Number 38. How does Professor Carmichael characterize travel to other stars? This is the end of Part B. Go on to Part C. Now read along with the directions for Part C in your book as they are read to you on the tape.
Part C. Direction. This part of the test consists of several talks, each given by a single speaker. After each of these talks, there are a number of questions. You will hear each talk and question only once, and the questions are not written out. When you have heard each question, read the four answer choices and select the one, A, B, C, or D, that best answers the question based on what is directly stated or on what can be inferred. Then fill in the space on your answer sheet that matches the letter of the answer that you have selected. Here is an example. You will hear, Students, this evening we'll have a chance to observe a phenomenon that we've discussed several times in class. Tonight there will be a lunar eclipse. As we've said, when an eclipse of the moon occurs, the earth passes between the sun and the moon. Therefore, the shadow of the earth moves across the surface of the moon and obscures it. Because you won't be looking at the sun, it is not necessary to use the special lenses and filters that you need when observing a solar eclipse. You can observe a lunar eclipse with your unaided eye or with a telescope and photograph it with an ordinary camera. So if the weather is not cloudy tonight, go out and take a look at this eclipse of the moon. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. Now, here is a sample question. You will hear, In what course is this lecture probably being given? You will read, A. Philosophy B. Meteorology C. Astronomy D. Photography The lecture concerns a lunar eclipse a topic that would typically be discussed in an astronomy class. The choice that best answers the question, in what course is this lecture probably being given, is C, astronomy. You should fill in C on your answer sheet. Here is another sample question. You will hear, according to the speaker, which of the following occurs during a lunar eclipse? You will read, A, the Earth's shadow moves across the moon. B. Clouds block the view of the moon. C. The moon moves between the earth and the sun. D. The sun can be observed without special equipment. From the lecture, you learn that a lunar eclipse occurs when the earth moves between the sun and the moon, and the shadow of the earth passes across the moon. The choice that best answers the question, according to the speaker, which of the following occurs during a lunar eclipse is A. The Earth's shadow moves across the moon. Don't forget, during actual exams, taking notes or writing in your test book is not permitted. Now let's begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 39 to 41. Listen to a talk given at a newspaper office. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Daily Gazette building. As I'm sure you're aware from your journalism classes, large newspapers are divided into a number of areas, all of them important to the success of the overall operation. We'll be visiting three important departments today. We'll begin our tour with a visit to the Circulation Department, which is responsible for distributing the paper all over the city. Then we'll move to the Editorial Department. In that department, there's the City Desk, which is responsible for gathering and reporting local news. The National Desk and the International Desk are there too, and various feature desks. Since you're probably most interested in that part of our operation, we'll be spending most of our time there and you'll have a chance to chat with some of our reporters. Finally, we'll visit the production department, where the newspaper is printed. Please step this way. Number 39. Whom is the speaker addressing? Number 40. 
Where will the people listening to this talk go first? Number 41. According to the speaker, what type of work is done at the city desk? Listen to part of a talk about a special student program. Good evening. For you who don't know me, I'm Professor McKenzie of the School of Architecture here at Hunt University. I've been involved with Semester Afloat for some years now, so I've been asked to give this introductory talk about the program. So, what is Semester Afloat? It's an educational program that is held aboard an ocean-going ship, the SS Apollo. There are three programs you can sign up for, one in the Eastern Mediterranean, one in the Western Mediterranean, and one in Southeast Asia. You'll have the opportunity to see some unforgettable sights. There are many social activities, and you'll make lasting friendships during the semester you spend on the ship. But tonight, I want to talk mainly about the academic program. The SS Apollo is a floating university. The faculty is recruited from the top universities in North America. There's an excellent library aboard. You'll study the history, language, art, and architecture of the countries that you visit. I myself have taught courses in historical architecture during two Eastern Mediterranean programs. And I can tell you, those classes are unlike any classes you can take here at Hunt or anywhere else. For example, last semester, I gave a lecture about Greek temple design one morning, and that afternoon, I took my class out to see several Greek temples for themselves. Oh, and of course, for all the classes you take, you'll receive academic credit at almost any university in the United States. Now, I have a lot more information about this program for you, but before I go on, I want to introduce two students who took part in Semester Afloat last semester and you can ask them any questions you like. Number 42. What aspect of the Semester Afloat program does Professor McKenzie's talk focus on? Number 43. What did Professor McKenzie teach during the Semester Afloat programs? Number 44. With which of these Semester Afloat programs was Professor McKenzie associated? Number 45. What does Professor McKenzie say about semester afloat classes? Number 46. Whom will Professor McKenzie introduce to the audience next? Questions 47 to 50. Listen to a talk about Olympic speed skating. Speed skating has been a Winter Olympic event for many years. But in recent years, conditions on the ice tracks used by speed skaters have gotten better. Until the most recent Winter Olympics, speed skating events were held outdoors. Conditions on outdoor ice tracks vary from hour to hour, depending on the weather. On indoor tracks, conditions can be controlled, giving all skaters an equal opportunity to skate at the top of their form. On indoor tracks, a constant temperature of 20 degrees Fahrenheit can be maintained. This is important because if the ice is too cold, it forms frost, slowing down the skaters, and it chips easily. If the temperature is too high, the ice begins to melt. Also, Ice tracks today are made with extremely pure water. Minerals in water make ice soft, and soft ice doesn't provide enough resistance for skates. 
recent improvements in making and maintaining ice will almost certainly lead to new world records in speed skating in the near future. Number 47. What aspect of speed skating does the speaker primarily discuss? Number 48. What does the speaker imply about speed skaters who competed before the most recent Winter Olympics? Number 49. According to the speaker, what happens to ice that contains too many minerals? Number 50. What prediction does the speaker make about the near future? This is the end of Section 1, Listening Comprehension. Stop work on Section 1.